I'm Janine Rocht from Clear Creek Distillery, where we make the wonderful McCarthy's Oregon Single Malt Whiskey. Uh, Steve McCarthy, Clear Creek's founder, uh, founded the distillery in 1985. Uh, everything was based on fruit grown within the region, our pear brandy. In 1985, he was sourcing um, quite a few thousand pounds of pears from the Hood River Valley. And after the next few years of adding other fruit spirits, he decided to go on vacation. Uh, he went on vacation uh, in Ireland with his wife, Cindy. And uh, the story, I've heard it change as the years go on. He's told it from many different versions, but this is the version that I've decided is uh, the one that actually happened. Um, in Ireland, the weather was just horrendous. And uh, you know those days where you just get stuck inside. It's just muddy and stormy. And um, Anyway, the cabin where Steve McCarthy got stuck happen to have an excellent collection of Isla-style scotches. And his wife, not being much of a drinker, uh, she would you know, paint and do her art while he made his way through the collection. Uh, he says slowly but surely, I think it was a little faster than that, uh, but he decided that Lagavulin 16 year was just the bee's knees, thought it was fantastic, and once they got unstuck from that cabin, they made their way back home to Portland, Oregon, uh, he decided, you know what, I've got stills, I've got the means, I've spent a lot of money and time on the licensing, I'm going to make a single malt. And at that time, about 21 years ago, uh, no one else domestically was making a single malt. Uh, past Prohibition, he was actually uh, the first one to do so. So McCarthy started out um, without any domestic uh, partners, without anything to emulate outside of uh, being a, a little cousin to an Isla-style scotch. So Steve McCarthy decided to uh, look for sourcing, look for barley, and landed upon the barley that was grown in Scotland. We do grow a lot of barley in the Pacific Northwest. We grow a lot of beautiful fruit. Uh, but he was having a really hard time sourcing enough for him to make a single malt. But for most growers, it was about this much. They weren't as interested in selling this much and spending so much time on a product that they thought wouldn't sell. Who likes peated whiskey, right? So uh, still to this day, we source the barley from Scotland. Uh, we do not have brewing equipment. At the distillery, we have brandy making equipment, which is essentially wine making equipment because brandy's distilled wine. Wine's just fermented fruit. But in order to make a single malt, a whiskey, you need to essentially make a beer. You need to ferment grain. So Steve McCarthy called up his buddy, Kurt Widmer. They weren't as big back then. And they were really excited to start on this project. So just over the river, we actually work with the Widmer brothers to make the wort or the wash. Uh, we distill just once in our copper pot stills. In Scotland, it's traditional to distill twice. Um, we don't because that's what we do. And it turned out really well. Trickling out of the still tasted fantastic, distilled just once. Our stills hold 60 gallons, which is known as a pretty small copper pot still. Uh, but it works for us, and it's what we need. So after being distilled just once, we aged it for three years in Oregon oak, uh, Quercus gariana, not a common oak. Quercus alba is the most common oak used uh, domestically and actually abroad now for a lot of whiskeys and a lot of spirits, American oak. But Oregon oak has a little bit of a tighter grain, uh, a little more vanillins going through. Uh, it can be a little forward on tannins, but uh, we tend to dial it back a little by using both used and new. We bottle it at 85 proof and we do not chill filter. So we liken it to um, a, a, a product that uh, we make with pride that started out in Scotland, that we finish in Oregon. Uh, we add the lovely tap water that comes out of our um, uh, distillery faucets. Uh, we do a light filter, add the water to bring it down to proof, and um, this can go up against any great Isla-style scotch, Lagavulin, and Lafroig, and the price point um, is quite friendly especially compared to a lot of the newer domestic whiskeys on the market. It's been around uh, over 20 years. We have it dialed in. It's fantastic. So let's talk about what we're really trying to um, discuss here in terms of why should you have this on your back bar? Yeah, and this is a conversation that I've always had as a buyer, um, especially with especially these higher end products, 
is they're great, they taste fantastic, but how am I gonna execute this in a bar program? So that's kind of what we're gonna be focusing on uh, now is what are some classic ways to do it and um, how do you get the most for your money and, and utilize a great product in your bar program? So what's really interesting working at Clear Creek as long as I have, uh, this answer has actually changed. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, if you were to ask me you know, long ago, uh, how does how does this fit in the bar program? You're actually talking about how does it fit in the wine program? How does it fit in the kitchen? Uh, how does it fit outside of anything but cocktail? Because cocktails have always been a thing, but not as popular as they are right now. So um, the answer long ago was we're going to head to the kitchen. We're going to head to the sommelier. We're going to talk to you know the, the four people that are going to come every week and ask for scotch neat. That conversation has evolved. Um, thankfully not devolved, but now the conversation is how do I make sense out of that, using that real estate on the back bar because that's what it is. It's real estate. Are you making your margins? How much inventory do you have to do every month? I mean, there are so many different things that a bar manager has to um, be responsible for and take care of. I'm not going to come in and expect you to put this on the shelf and it collect dust. Uh, so so how, do we, how do we tackle this issue? I think there are a few different ways that mm -hmm. you can tackle the issue. Um, the first one is the simplest. Serve it neat. On the always rocks, a fan. Always a fan. Yeah. Um, I'm never going to, this is, of course, a conversation that a lot of people have, and I always feel that a judgment call based on some, how someone drinks their whiskey is a poor choice, especially as someone who is trying to give customer service. Uh, so I'm not going to judge you if you want a big, fat piece of ice. Uh, with your single malt, if you want to dilute it, great. That's how you um, that's how you like it, great. If you want it neat, simple. You have a single malt selection on your back shelf that is uh, quite affordable compared to a lot of scotch uh, that is you know aged um, the same period of time, aged a little longer. Uh, you have your answer for someone who wants maybe a classy boiler maker after their after their day of work and their nice local beer uh, because we have such a great beer culture in this country I know um, but what do you do besides that I mean realistically the last time that you've gone out with a circle of friends how many people drink digesties some people drink things neat some people drink wine but we have a lot of you know cocktails uh, but just because you are a bar manager with a cocktail program doesn't mean that the reason for this bottle to be on your back bar doesn't necessarily need to be in a cocktail on the menu uh, so what do you do what do you do with a price point that is definitely affordable compared to other things on the market that are competitors um, what are the other options and I always like to think about flights so not only are you educating uh, these wonderful customers coming through the door some people just want to sit True. and they've had a horrible day they just want their drink they just want you to shut up like, don't Education about, is the last thing on their mind. That is the last thing on their mind. They're like, you know what? Don't don't tell me that you know I'm um, ordering the wrong cocktail. Don't tell me that I can't order a pink drink. Uh, so you have you have those customers and you take care of them. True. But then you have those people that are like, you know, tell me something. What is this bar telling me? What are you telling me? Or maybe they're in from out of town. This especially works at hotel bars. You have people that are constantly coming in. Um, you have less regulars although sometimes more frequent throughout the year, you have less regulars than some other bars. So in terms of education, you have this great little flight. Maybe it's scotch and you throw in a domestic single malt. Maybe it's, you know what, down the street, there's a distillery that does A, B, and C. Not only are flights very, um, they work really well in a menu, in a cocktail menu, because people want to search and be educated and know what's going on locally, you can end up with a lesser pour. Sure. You don't need the two ounce pour. Let's say we do, you know, a flight of half ounce pours, right. or we do a flight of one ounce. You have a lot of um, versatility, and I think that that works really well in uh, bar programs where you want to have that little extra sure. um, something for the customer that's looking for education. Yeah, and one of the things that I've I've um, seen in the past is a, a big focus on uh, flights as it pertains to single malts. But I like your idea as well of not only focusing on whiskeys, but also local. Like, let's do a flight of local spirits, so that way you get a really cool sampling of what we offer in our area. So that could be a, a really great thing um, to add to any bar program. 
Um, so that's a, a great idea. Sure. So, yeah. And sometimes, you know, you have busy service and you're trying to, you know, deal with the people that just want you to shut up and you're dealing with the people that are really high maintenance. And with a flight program, even if you get something printed and you have the education printed on your little flight mat. Yeah. And then, yeah, you can answer this question, but you know what? Here's the mat. Read that. Right. This is this is what we're doing tonight. You're going to enjoy this single malt and maybe you'll order a cocktail afterwards with it. Sure. And maybe you won't. Maybe you'll leave my bar and never come back again. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But um, I think I think it allows people to really get in, invested in, in that bar program. Sure. A more. Absolutely. And now, um, what are some of the examples that you've seen with McCarthy's used in cocktails? Or how? what what is a classic cocktail that you would recommend um, if you were going to use something like this in the program? So I am a big fan because for me personally, um, you know, traveling a lot, drinking a lot of cocktails, I'm always enamored and impressed by people that can whip and spin. And uh, myself, I love cocktails, but at home, I want something very simple. Sure. So my answer is probably a little different, although it can be applied in the bar. Um, as, a, as a home cocktailer, I would go with my basic three ingredient cocktails. I think a Rob Roy is great for the single malt. Um, not just domestically at home, you're talking about a two ounce pour of the whiskey, sure. vermouth, bitters, super simple, um, garnish with a cherry, or you can do a twist. I prefer a cherry, but it uh, depends on, on your taste. I think that it also allows a bar program to work with those uh, percentages within that two ounce pour. Mm -hmm. You can do a little McCarthy's and a blended scotch, or you can pull in your local whiskey. You can start to, you know, have, this has been around 20 years, it's, sure. you know, has this pedigree, but we also have this local whiskey. Try it together in this cocktail. Or you could really work with the margins and use a blended scotch that is incredibly affordable so you're still making the same margin off this cocktail, right. regardless of how expensive you know, this is. Yeah, um, and f some of the ways I use um, High End Spirits um, is you really want to deliver the value of the name and the ingredient itself um, and how to stretch that out. So there's a couple ways um, that I've done it in the bar program. Um, the first, and something I'm sure we've all seen, is a spritz or a wash. Um, this is something we've seen um, with the Sazerac, for example, when we use absinthe. Um, it just brings enough of the aroma and backbone to the cocktail that really makes it a whole different cocktail. I know Lagavulin um, and McCarthy's um, has that really powerful kind of peat presence to it. Um, so using a spritz or a wash in this case, you know, just washing the rim or spritzing the rim is going to bring that really beautiful aroma from all the peat. Um, it's going to have a little bit of that malty backbone on the initial sip. Um, and it's a great way to put a name brand um, that people are going to recognize or say, wow, I can't believe you're making this cocktail with that ingredient um, and stretching out that ingredient for the customer. Um, it's a great way to introduce people to a new brand as well. Absolutely. Um, and then I think um, on the same note is all about stretching the ingredient but through blending. Um, so to your point on the Rob Roy, if you have a blended scotch and you kind of substitute, you know, if it's a two ounce pour, doing a one ounce pour of blended scotch with an ounce pour of McCarthy's um, in your Rob Roy. So that way you do get that flavor. You do kind of have all those layers in the cocktail itself, um, but you're not going to kill your margins. Um, but yeah, it's it's another great way to um, to to use these beautiful examples of, of spirits um, well in a bar program and still be responsible to the financials at the end of the month. Sure. Yeah. Um, and the last one that I can remember is a fairly famous cocktail um, called the Penicillin. I believe it was Sam Ross um, up in New York that came across this one um, or invented this one, but um, it uses a quarter ounce of uh, Isla whiskey and it just provides this really beautiful kind of peat aroma and backbone to the cocktail. So it's another way of um, using a brand like this in a bar program. Sounds delicious. Yeah, I think that most importantly, you know, our, our job here, you know, is to educate and whatever, but the bar program needs to work. It needs to function. It needs to pay the bills. Uh, you've got to take care of your staff. You have to take care of your customers. 